You flew the, the scooter? I flew the scooter. Uh, I flew like six different airplanes. Uh, they're all a lot of fun. Uh, but if I had one airplane uh, to go back to fly one flight in, it would be this airplane. It's the A4 Skyhawk, built by the Douglas Company. I had never met a pilot who, who didn't fall in love with it. Uh, it wasn't fast, it was subsonic, but it was tremendously maneuverable. Uh, if you went and did a full stick roll, it would set you free. And it really would. Uh, I flew this with the Marine Corps Reserve Squadron. When I left back in duty after 12 years, uh, I flew with DMA 124 and flying in for my man was absolutely fell in love with this airplane. So, uh, reflecting back on your 14 years in the Marine Corps, yeah. Tell me about that. Uh, I always tell people that everything I, I know about leadership I learned in the United States Marine Corps. To this day, the most flex flexible, adaptive organization I've ever been part of is the United States Marine Corps. Um, I learned things like uh, the importance of commitment and, and integrity and teamwork. And uh, I learned the importance of identity and purpose and principles to high performance organizations. I was taught the concept of centralized command and decentralized control, which I applied uh, later in my life to some of the challenges I faced at the Boeing Company, which organization transformation. Um, and beyond that, uh, the Marine Corps motto is Semper Fidelis, always be. And uh, to this day, my Marine Corps brethren are my closest friends. And when we email or write each other, all of us end the correspondence the same way. SF, Semper Fidelis. Remarkable stuff. So uh, after the Marine Corps, you went to NASA. Yes. And you flew some pretty interesting stuff at NASA. Uh, this is not a typical flight for DC-9. Can you tell me why this was a good idea? Yeah, so. <laughs> so yeah, I joined NASA. I, I, I left that in your service with the Marine Corps. And, uh, NASA Lewis Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio, as a civilian research test pilot. And uh, I gotta tell you, I mean, for a test pilot, this is one of the best sandboxes in the world to play. Yeah, we, we got an interesting little video up in here. Yeah, this, this is we, uh, I was gonna say, we, we, uh, yeah, yeah, we let's start let's, now. Yeah, let's go back one. We're going to go back one. Yeah, that's okay. I know I'm taking control of the presentation. <laughs> You're the boss. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> But uh, yeah, we had we had uh, eight different airplanes, lots of incredible projects. We had six pilots, and, and we had absolutely no limits of supervision. Um, so you know, it was just a tremendous opportunity for me. Uh, and to get exposure to things we've never been exposed to before. We did a lot of aeronautical research. We did a lot of space support missions. And one of the space support missions was uh, the DC-9 or microgravity research aircraft. And the mission of this aircraft was uh, to provide 25 to 35 seconds of service. And unlike uh, the astronaut training airplane, the KC-135 in Houston, uh, we had the full precise levels of zero G, um, zero plus or minus 200 of a G for 25 to 35 seconds in all three axes of the airplane. Uh, this DC-9 is a stock DC-9. We did nothing to this airplane. It flew this profile out like it was designed to fly it. Um, and to, to fly you, you would accelerate to 350 knots, pull the nose up to 65 degrees, nose up. Uh, you would then push over uh, to zero G and you hold that parabolic trajectory until you got the 40 degrees nose down. And then you'd go two and a half G, pull up, back up to 65 degrees, nose up, and go through another one. I actually did 82 of these in a row one day. Um, so we're going to show the video and show you what that kind of looks like. And you'll see next to this orange display on the top right, you'll see the altitude. Every revolution of the altimeter needle is a thousand feet. And you'll see it's spinning pretty good. You can see it right there. Oh, wow. Oh, my goodness. And you see the little bracket in the ribbon that's uh, plus or minus 200 of G throughout the program. Oh, my. That's so cool. And uh, just to show you, it wasn't all work and no play. <laughs> So there was an accident in uh, 
Roseland, Indiana about that time. Yes. And that led to a big NASA research project. Yeah, that was an American Eagle flight 4184, and uh, the airplane crashed outside of Rosen, uh, Indiana, uh, in October uh, of that year, and killing all 68 on board, and uh, the cause was determined to be ice contaminated control surfaces. So the FAA asked uh, NASA to uh, launch a three phase program to investigate uh, that phenomenon and to recommend new certification criteria for flight into ice conditions. Uh, I was assigned as the, the lead pilot, the only pilot. Uh, for phase one, and for phase one was to go explore the degradation and civilian control of the, the aircraft with different uh, uh, ice shapes on the tailplane. And so if I get this right, you, you glued a whole bunch of ice shapes on the tail, climbed the thing up to altitude, and then shut off both engines and start doing tailplane stunts. Yes. This was a good idea. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, uh, so for people that know the Twin Otter, the Twin Otter is like an overgrown Cessna 172. Um, you know, the versatile control system, and you know, it, it, fly, it flies pretty well. Uh, and we did this over a whole airfield, so we couldn't get the engines to the decline in for a landing. And I, you know, I had done, I had done engine out in a Harrier, which only has one engine, and uh, you know, that doesn't fly very well. Right. So, but with tailplane stalls, the airplane does some pretty tricky. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting phenomenon. It's, uh, you know, if you look at the, uh, the graphic here, uh, you know, the way we just scenario there. Aerodynamic force from his lift. The lift acts behind the center of gravity of the aircraft, right, which wants to pitch the nose down. Uh, the tailplane uh, produces a, an aerodynamic force in the downward direction to balance that out and, and provide stability to the vehicle. Uh, when you have ice contamination on the leading edge of the tailplane, uh, you disrupt the flow across the tail and you lose that aerodynamic force, which causes the nose to pitch over uncontrollably. And in an aircraft with a reversible control system, uh, the first thing the pilot does is, is the wind pump snaps out of his hand all the way towards the instrument panel. And in the case of a, uh, a SOC 340 going into the Detroit Metro one day, uh, it was estimated that the pilot had to pull the 400 pounds of force to pull that wheel pump back out of that stall. Um, so we, we needed to go look at that, characterize it, and um, And you said this was some of the riskiest test flying It was. I mean, I actually was I was actually getting into that phenomenon of, of the wheel column snapping out of the hands. And, uh, and I found it was tremendously uh, sensitive to pitch rate. And uh, I actually got to the point that uh, I could actually pitch at the right rate and it would just teeter back and forth between a positive and a reverse force gradient. Um, and I got very relaxed, but I flew about 80 hours and, uh, and uh, we collected a tremendous amount of data which led to the original certification standards for ice conditions. You know, and to this day, I, I really consider that work to be the most important contribution I've ever made to the field of aviation research. Yeah. And hopefully it led to saving a lot of lives. Yeah, interesting. So, uh, you, mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. you continued to fly the Harrier. I did. NASA had that, and so that was sort of your sandbox. Yes, yeah. uh, we haven't enjoyed the sandbox. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is a variable stability Harrier, and uh, variable stability system uh, you can program it to really uh, emulate uh, stability control characteristics of a lot of different vehicles. And uh, NASA had used this vehicle to develop uh, advanced flight control systems for next generation stolen plants. So a lot of the work that we did actually found its way into this airplane. It's the next airplane. Next yeah. Airplane. And, right, Boeing was developing this joint strike fighter. Yes. And they obviously needed somebody with an aerial background. So how did the Boeing company go about getting it? Well, I, uh, I was sitting at my desk at NASA one day, and I got a call from a uh, gentleman by the name of Don Burton, who was on the Boeing Joint Strike Fighter team. And he said, well, you know, we, uh, we're we looking for a, a baseball test pilot, and everybody that we talked to said, we got to call you. Um, and I said, well, I'm flattered, and, uh, you know, thanks for the call, but I'm not interested. And, uh, you know, I gave him the name of a couple of their pilots, and he hung up the phone, and uh, I went back to work, and three hours later, he calls me back, and he's kind of perplexed. He said, why did you turn this down so fast? I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm very happy here in NASA. It's a fun sandbox to play. And uh, I'm halfway through a PhD in aerospace engineering. I don't really want to give that up. And uh, he said, don't you understand what we're offering you? I mean, you could be the chief pilot at next point. And uh, I said, you know, thanks for no thanks. Uh, well, you know, I'm a Marine, and there's a saying in the Marine Corps, once a Marine, always a Marine. Marine. I started getting phone calls from senior Marine officers. Uh, retired and active duty and saying, uh, I need to go interview this 
job. So I uh, saluted smartly and uh, <laughs> went out to Seattle and uh, with no expectation of taking the job. Uh, but I was curious about the airplane. And uh, along the way, uh, only kind of sweetened the deal, uh, thanks to a guy who would end up being my director of uh, flight operations, flight operations and chief test pilot to the entire enterprise, Chuck Kilberg, at the time F-22 chief pilot. Uh, he convinced DCA that, uh oh, we're dying. Uh, <laughs> he convinced DCA that uh, if, if they brought me in on the commercial airplane side and led me to BDS, uh, such that if we didn't win JSF, I would sell a job. He was betting that I would take that job, and he was right. Uh, and uh, I spent the first day with JSF, the second day with BCA, and was so impressed with the company that uh, I threw that PhD behind me and, uh, <laughs> and joined the company. So you were assigned to the X-32B, the, the vertical part of the program, the X-32A being the non-vertical lift airplane. Right. So tell me a little bit about the X-32B and this direct lift system, because we're yeah. going to show some videos about this. Yeah, the X-32A was, uh, was the vehicle that we had used to demonstrate the conventional flying qualities for the Air Force variant and the carrier approach count uh, qualities for the Navy variant the airplane. The X-32B was uh, the demonstrator for the short takeoff, hover, and vertical landing capability for the Marine Corps. Uh, shown here, if you look at the uh, engine in gold, uh, I want to point out that's the exact same engine that's in the X-32A. No changes other than a different software level. And if you look at the components in blue, those are the components that were unique to the X-32B only. Uh, the total weight of those blue components is 650 pounds. Not much of an impact. Uh, so, you know, we really felt that we had achieved the goal of a highly competent family of airplanes for the customer. Uh, so you, you took the airplane back, this is returning it back to Earth? Yeah, we did, uh, the initial, we did the first flight of the X-32B uh, at Edwards Air Force Base, carried the airplane across the country to Texas, Maryland, and then this is where we did the uh, power lift testing, the short takeoff, the hover and the vertical landings. So for most airplanes, the first flight is the big thing, but with yeah. a vertical lift airplane, the first hover and first vertical yeah. landing are yeah. really kind of a thing. So we have some videos from, from some of the first hover stuff here. So uh, this was on a Sunday morning, in fact, it was on the morning, June 24th of uh, 2001, and uh, this is me coming to the uh, and uh, to this day, the greatest moment of my flying career. Uh, you said this airplane was really safe. This airplane was tremendously safe, and uh, handled uh, beautifully. We uh, hovered four times that day, and uh, the fourth time we hovered for over four minutes, and uh, the engine actually produced uh, 700 pounds more thrust than So that took you on to the first vertical landing. Yes. And this actually looks just peachy. Yeah, it looks great. Uh, but uh, things weren't always as they seem, I guess. Uh, during this vertical landing, our first vertical landing was over Hover Pit. Hover Pit is designed to mitigate the jet boost effects that occur closer to the ground on a flat surface during vertical landing, uh, which can destabilize the aircraft. To mitigate that in testing uh, for risk reduction, uh, you can land on a pit, which is great, usually over a 40 foot hole, uh, so you minimize those destabilizing jet induced effects. Uh, but this particular pit, pit had a critical design flaw, and it wasn't deep enough, it was only 10 feet deep. And what happened is, as I was coming down on that first vertical landing, uh, the hot gas from the lift nozzles hit the bottom of the pit, migrated up the sidewalls, back into the engine tank. Um, Jet engines and hot gas don't mix. Uh, what happens is the engine immediately loses the power and you risk the stall. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. As I came down, all of a sudden I felt the bottom drop out of the airplane. And I went full power like that, and it just kept coming down faster. And I, uh, I had the red warning light going off in the cockpit. The voice warning system was, was kind of yelling, warning, warning, engine, engine. Uh, testing director said, you know, wave it off, which means add full power and climb. And I can say his name was Howard, and I said Howard I got down, and uh, and I just uh, centered up the airplane to minimizing allowing the drift and uh, you know brace for impact. And then another remarkable thing happened. Uh, at 20 feet, um, the hot gas congestion went away, and the engine fully recovered to full power, uh, and I touched down at the target rate of descent. <laughs> and um, 
it's a look at the Irish film. It is. <laughs> and uh, one of our other test pilots was in a truck about 50 feet away watching him. Uh, and he said, excellent landing Irish. I said, I'll tell you about it later. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, and then I asked the control, what just happened? And, uh, and they very quickly figured out it's like gas congestion. And to their credit, uh, they were able to convince the Naval Air Systems Command that are present that day in the control room convinced me everything must be fine when we went to flat surface. And 20 minutes later, we went and conducted the first vertical landing on the flat surface, and it went without a hitch. Worked really well. Yeah, it was, the, it was just a great day for the program. Yeah. It really was. Here's you in the airplane doing a, a short takeoff. This thing had a lot of power. Yeah, so a short takeoff, you actually accelerate the cruise nozzle. So when you get to 70 knots, you hit a button on the throttle, shifts the flow to the lift nozzle. Uh, so you start with this kick in the pants, and then you get this kick from underneath that grows you into the air. Uh, and when you accelerate out uh, to about 140 knots, you hit the flow switch button again, and it takes all that uh, thrust back to the cruise. And uh, test pilots are test pilots are trained to give a running technical commentary about the vehicle as you're flying the maneuver. And uh, uh, the other way I can describe the feeling of this is. You take off, you're accelerating, uh, and 500 G get close to button, and you kind of go like this, and you're up in the air. But the most remarkable thing is, you accelerate 550 knots, you've got vertical thrust. So when you hit the flow switch button and take that away, the airplane wants to sag, so we program the controls to actually pitch those up an extra two degrees. And then, you know, all that thrust and cruise nozzle kicks in. So it just kind of feels like you're going here like this, and then you go, so like this, and then you go. <laughs> and uh, my technical uh, comment to the control room was, oh my god, I, I love my life. <laughs> they had it reported it. <laughs> so it was a competition between the uh, X-32 and the yeah. X-35, yeah. and the X-35 won the, won the competition. Right. For anybody that hasn't seen it, there's a really good NPR uh, program on the selection process that's, uh, that's fascinating, it tells the whole story. Uh, but it had been kind of your concern about the whole program was that if Boeing didn't win this, uh, where do you go? Yeah, and uh, um, you know, you, you, people can argue back and forth with a better airplane. I want to get into that argument. Uh, but, but I will say we had a better team. We had a better engineering team. We had a better management team. We had a better manufacturing team. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, so you know, it's a shame that, that that team did not get to really start their stuff in the next phase of the program because Done well. And um, your airplane ended up back at Fax River in a museum. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is my old friend. It looks like it's ready to fly now. Um, you know, I, I got a chance to see it uh, not too long ago. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you came back to commercial airplanes and were assigned as a deputy to my character, Pathfinder, who's here this evening, on the Boeing project called the Sonic Cruiser. Yeah, so I, I, uh, I'm very fortunate. I came to BCA and how many test flights to get assigned? Another new program, um, but uh, I was given that opportunity. John Cashman actually uh, assigned me to the program as a deputy of Mike, and I was very fortunate to, to work with John Cashman, who I consider to be uh, one of the top five test pilots in the history of the Boeing company, quite honestly. Um, I, was, I learned a tremendous amount from John Cashman in three years. I was uh, very fortunate to work with my character, who I consider to be the foremost authority in the history of test and certification of Boeing airplanes. He is a walkie-talkie encyclopedia of knowledge yeah. about test and certification and, and a very talented test pilot on top of it. So one of the things that's really remarkable about your career is that you did Navy and then you did Marines and then you did Air Force. You wore all three uniforms and flew in all three of those services. Yes, yeah, so I had a lot of my uniforms. Um, <laughs> yeah, I left active in service in the Marine Corps. I spent two years in the Reserve, and as part of the drawdown in the mid 90s uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, my Marine Corps squadron got decommissioned, and then I uh, got an air service transfer to the Air Force Reserve where I flew C 130s, C 141s, and was selected uh, to lead the uh, first uh, C 17 squadron in the 4th Air Force. Uh, and uh, ultimately, I ended up becoming vice commander of the 4th Corps, Corps 6th Air Lift Wing um, at the 4th Air Force Base, and later Wing Commander. And, uh, you know, tremendously proud of what my squadron did. We won the Air Force Unstable Unit Award. We were the best squadron in the wing. 
and uh, it was a real tribute to the team. And filled in everything in your little red book, too. <laughs> yeah, I did, yeah. And I retired in 2005 the rank of Colonel. And, yeah. uh, and, 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 you know, and, and, uh, when I look back at everything I've done in my life, my 29 years of military service is what I'm most proud of. Yeah. yeah. So you took a, a little uh, left-hand turn and went back to a little program called the Eclipse 500. Yeah, so actually, um, they called and asked me to come down and interview, and uh, I actually, you know, I asked my wife Kelly, who was working at BCA Market, to come to me in. So we went down there, and while I was interviewing, uh, one of the marketing uh, uh, leaders uh, took Kelly on a tour of the airplane facility and uh, quickly found out what a very special lady she is and with her knowledge of uh, flight operations, maintenance, and training. And, uh, and as the story goes, when uh, the leaders of Eclipse were discussing whether to hire him or not, he walked in and said, I don't know if you're going to hire him. But you definitely have to hire her. <laughs> so, so they actually offered her a job before they offered me a job. Yeah. So I had to come because she was moving. Um, so, so the Eclipse was a fascinating airplane. Uh, you know, very light jet, uh, you know, much greater speed and altitude capability than a similar uh, set of turboprop for about the same price. And uh, uh, you know, we, we loved our time at Eclipse, and it was an exciting environment to work in. Small startup. Uh, team, no bureaucracy, everybody focused on mission. And I always said, you know, that the strength and weakness of the company was they really didn't know much about the aerospace industry. And that was a strength because they challenged old paradigms of how best to design and manufacture an airplane. And it was a weakness too because they, they just didn't really have a good understanding of the complexity of the aerospace supply chain, nor FAA certification. So they, they had a few surprises along the way, but ultimately they were successful. At, at the same time, Boeing was facing a really big challenge. Uh, Kenny Higgins retired, right, and we had some challenges with the 787 delivery process, and so both of those airplanes needed to be certified at the same time. Right. And so Boeing went to find you to come back and help solve this little puzzle. Yeah, it was actually, uh, you know, Ken Higgins, uh, here on the quarter of the Jim Morris, Al Malali, uh, actually they, you know, they welcomed me back. <laughs> so, and, and then uh, Jim Jameson had to be a pretty tough assignment to get the uh, 787 to dash 8 uh, through test and certification, which really required a major re, uh, reorganization and rethinking of how we, we do flight tests. And um, uh, I think we got a slide that really talks yeah. about the concept. We, we have a couple of those. One was yeah. that you developed a thing called the Test Operations Center. Yes. It was really a, a different way of tackling how we manage the programs. Yes. Uh, you know, prior to, to the Test Operations Center, you know, each airplane team kind of operated as an independent team. And, uh, uh, you know, that might have worked when you've got unlimited resources and assets to support those teams. Uh, but we didn't. And, you know, the team that got the most support tended to be the team that screened the last. And, uh, you know, we kind of took a look at that and said, you know, instead of operating as independent teams, uh, we thought it would be better to operate as a test fleet uh, with a test operations center to coordinate and prioritize the activities of all those airplanes. And the best way to compare that is, you know, imagine if a conductor simply walks up to the podium and says, everybody just do your best. <laughs> what would that sound like? It just wouldn't sound very good. The conductor is there to really coordinate, right? Um, and that's what the test operations center was. It was really the conductor of the orchestra. It, it required sort of a, a rethink of how we went about our business. Yeah, yeah it's really interesting. And, um, you know, I think, uh, any leader who's asked to lead an organization for a large-scale transformational uh, change effort, you know, that, that's a very dangerous position to be in. You know, why it's dangerous is uh, you are challenging people's most dearly held things. Uh, the things they hold the most dear are like their daily work habits and their tools and their methods and uh, their way of thinking and ultimately their beliefs. and. Uh, yeah. So we understood we had to actually get to the bottom of the expert and, and really make an environment where it's safe to people to challenge each other's beliefs, understand how their beliefs are driving, driving the structure of the current operation system, um, and, and then understand that you know, there, there was something better. But why it's dangerous for a leader is you're challenging all those things they hold dear and offering nothing more than just the possibility of something better. That's a hard sell. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, you did have a little fun along the way. Yeah. Uh, you and Craig Bauman flying with uh, the Chief Technology Officer of the Boeing Company. Yes, John Tracy. And yeah. Uh, yeah, we took him on a 77 flight test. Craig is now uh, Vice President of Flight Operations for uh, the company. And John, I guess, was super impressed because he gave you an even bigger assignment. Yes, he did. Yeah. Uh, he and Jim McNerney gave me the assignment of consolidating all of the uh, Test uh, organizations across the entire enterprise into one consolidated test organization known as Boeing Test and Evaluation. And uh, to kind of give you an idea of what that was like, it's kind of like trying to integrate the United States with the European Union. Um, it was a tough, tough challenge because there were very different cultures in different parts of the, of the country. And again, we applied the same system, same principles, challenging people's beliefs, and uh, they get to help the case for change. And uh, ultimately, we were very successful. And Jim McNerney has often said that if we had not stood up BTE, we would not have gotten through the 787 or 7 8 shape. Yeah. Um, one of the things about rethinking was your red <laughs> round table, or roundabout. Red roundabout, sorry. Yeah. This is actually a picture of a real life roundabout. It scares the heck out of me. Yeah. So this is a this is the magic roundabout swim thing. It's a real roundabout, and you know Americans don't really like. This roundabout is uh, one big roundabout with five little roundabouts around about it. <laughs> and, and the interesting thing about this roundabout is that uh, it's got one of the safest accident records of any major intersection in Europe. And it's a wonderful example of pushing decision making down to the working level to make the system run efficiently. And it handles dynamic and changing volumes of traffic throughout the day coming from five different and on average, nobody stops stop from that roundabout at worst five minutes, usually an average of 45 seconds. And, and the drivers, the people at the working level, only have to know two principles. Follow these two principles. One, know where you want to go. Two, always give way to the vehicle on your right. That's all anybody at the working level needs to know to make this thing run efficiently. It's a great example of a complex, adaptive living system where the people at the working level can make it part. And I think it works a lot better than this one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is why I call the ordered alternative, um, or the top-down directed approach. And, um, you know, yeah, a really smart person who made that work and program for one set of traffic flows. Well, what happens when the traffic volume is changed? You get a traffic jam. And, you know, some people would say, well, hey, just have to move the light. But, uh, I know which one we wanted. We wanted to follow the principles of complex adaptive living systems, and uh, it worked very well for us to the stand up the BTA. Yeah. Um, wrapping up here, so uh, I missed one slide. This is actually a really remarkable shot. First, really two things here. This was the second Collier trophy that, that you and Kelly were involved in. Yes. Which nobody gets to do that. And second, to recognize Kelly, who is by herself a remarkable engineer, and it's actually Kelly's birthday. Uh, Kelly, would you please Kelly. stand to be recognized? Kelly's a remarkable lady in addition to being um, an aerospace engineer. She uh, she's an aircraft mechanic. She was a tanker crew chief in the Air Force in the 70s when well, there weren't a whole lot of women doing that. She's a talented artist. And uh, I, you know, 14 years of marriage, I'm still constantly in awe of her talents and creativity. And I always say that my best day at Bond is the day I met Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dennis, thank you very much. Matt, would you please come up on stage? All right, Matt, there you are. Congratulations, Dennis. Thank you.